นะโมทัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนะโมทัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนะโมทัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะปุถังธรรมังสังขังนมัสสะมิท o ดีสี่ยาฮอฟมูนเดย์ดิเซมเบอร์ดีเอ็ดแล้วเราจะจะรีเฟล็กติ้งว่าฉันคิดว่าครั้งที่แล้วที่ผมเสียชีวิตในเดือนธันวาคมของประเทศอังกฤษคือ1993ดังนั้นในเหตุผลใดก็ตามผมเคยอยู่ในประเทศอื่นมากแต่ผมพยายามที่จะไม่ปกป้องวันฤดูอังกฤษ And the uh, this this season, but um, one uh, one reason or another, I've uh, always uh, been away uh, in Thailand or in the the USA, and uh, so uh, this is the first opportunity I've had for a long, long time, twenty seven years since uh, I've had the chance to be here in this uh, period of early December, watching the. Uh, The light diminish each day, and uh, the kind of winter season uh, coming in with the frost and uh, foggy, colder weather. So it's uh, this year uh, the the pandemic has brought many difficulties and dangers and uh, and struggles. But one of the things on a personal level, I've found it's given me the chance to actually. Uh, be here in one place and watch the seasons change from the winter into spring, spring to summer, summer to autumn, and now autumn into winter. And that's that's been a a a rare opportunity and a chance to uh, get a a direct feeling for the the flow and change of the seasons and to, to be paying close attention to that. Uh, also, this uh, the pandemic, uh, as uh, people know, it's uh, continuing to um, have its impact uh, as the winter season comes on. The number of uh, infections and deaths are, are steadily, uh, steadily increasing. And uh, now here in the UK, more than sixty-two thousand people have passed away from the coronavirus. Uh, In countries like uh, Brazil, India, more than a hundred thousand people ha have passed away. In the USA, it's nearly three hundred thousand people have di have died from the you know, COVID nineteen um, uh, infection, and so and millions of people around the world uh, uh, suffering from the impact of the the illness, being infected themselves, or or. Uh, caring for people who are, who are ill and uh, looking after, uh, as family members or as doctors, nurses, social workers, and uh, many many varieties of care providers and so, uh, support workers, and also you know family members who have simply had to to live with those near and dear to them who are uh, suffering from the illness and who have passed away from it. So these are. Yeah, challenging and impactful times, and just just here in the the sanctuary of Amravati, we've managed to keep the uh, the virus on the outside so far. Touch wood, <laughs> as far as I know, so far. But uh, virtually every day, uh, I'm reading out dedications for people who are either suffering from the illness or have passed away from it, or or uh, other um, other diseases. And causes uh, our close friend of the sangha, Mudita Kun Mudita Surabi Karnasuta, who was a, a, a devoted disciple of, of Lumpur Cha for more than 40 years. And, uh, she just passed away in Thailand. Lived in uh, the um, uh, area close to Chithurst. She bought a place down near Chithurst Monastery, West Sussex. Moved out of London and had a A place down there, restaurant and, and pub, the Hamilton Arms, where she was based for a long, long time, and is a, a very um, dedicated, committed me uh, member of the lay community, and had a very good influence on the people around her. 
so she passed away from both pancreatic cancer and then the influence of, uh, of COVID-19 just a couple of days ago, a few days ago. Uh, the uh, the impact of uh, of uh, the illness and then also the season. You know, as the, the days get shorter every day, the dawn gets later, the dark comes earlier each day, and as we sort of inch towards the the winter solstice, uh, there's uh, and again, I think I've had this, one of the reasons uh, I have been reflecting on this is the, is the first opportunity I've had for a long time in in this country to uh, to really feel and to to experience directly that. Uh, shortening of the days, the coming on of the winter season, it's a, a little less impactful in California, where I lived for a long time. But uh, you can see why the, the, the uh, sort of, uh, on a very instinctual, natural level, there's a, a, a fear of, of winter, the things getting colder and darker, moving into the shadows of, of winter time, days getting shorter, and how on a very uh, ancient, basic level, there's a a, a recoiling from that, a, a fear of that, and how when the solstice comes uh, and we have the Christmas time and uh, there's, see, uh, there's celebrations that we have at the turning of the year, the, the return of the light, that sense of the, the darkness has reached its limit and the, the light element reasserts itself, there's a, 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 a rejoicing in that, a, a delighting in that. But uh, we're not quite there yet. <laughs> There's still an increasing of the dark uh, in, the, in terms of the season, uh, another couple of weeks until the, the solstice uh, arrives. So, so it, uh, it does bring to mind that sense of how we relate to death and, and loss and the, uh, the impact of the, the, uh, uh, the pandemic upon our lives here in, in this small community and uh, in this country and around the world. Also, uh, it, it brings to mind why why we call uh, why this place is called Amravati, the deathless realm, and and uh, how that uh, reflection on deathlessness. Uh, how does that relate to the impact and the, the 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 shocking and threatening presence of death and loss in in our lives? Uh, it's it's uh, you know, very uh, immediate and painful and tragic for for many many people. I was just seeing news reports, um, you know, just uh, how some people have had you know, many family members uh, either infected with the virus or died from the virus. And uh, how hard that is uh, on on the heart! What an impact that has upon the heart! Um, and how does that relate? That that kind of uh, shock to the system and, and the, the presence of that. We have uh, the the principle, the idea of of deathlessness, uh, the the counterpoint to that. And that's really why uh, well, the reason uh, uh, why Lumpur Sumedho chose the name for this monastery many, many years ago when it was uh, an idea in his mind and he moved towards establishing a place like this. It was the early 80s and there was a, a, a lot of threat. There was right in the, in the midst of the arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union and uh, the talk of limited nuclear war in Europe was uh, quite uh, commonly in, in the news and... Um, there were massive protests uh, by many, many people organized by groups like Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament and so on. But the fear of death was very, very thick in, in the air and a real uh, show of terror and uh, fear in the system that even if someone didn't deliberately start a nuclear war, things could be started by accident and, and uh, we would be right in the middle of it here in, in Northern Europe. So uh, one of the reasons why Lumpur Sumato chose the name Amravati, the deathless realm, was because of that that, uh, that fear of, of death, of the, the density of uh, the atmosphere, the thickness of the atmosphere on the emotional level in, in the human family. It's, it's very strong, very present, very immediate. So he wanted to raise up deathlessness as a counterpoint and to help us to remember and I was uh, around at that time and um, 
uh, here at Amravati in those early years. And uh, I remember Lumpur saying over and over again how this was important to to remember that, to bring this to mind that uh, uh, that the, the 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 mind and the heart are so easily overwhelmed by that uh, you know, the fear of death and and loss, and that the uh, uh, say emotions can be deeply entangled in that and so life can seem hopeless or uh, despairing so he wanted to sort of raise up <laughs> the alternative raise up the, the possibility or the the actuality of deathlessness and so and he also had, uh, he he loved the name of the of the uh, the name of amravati that uh, he'd heard uh, many years before he first heard of uh, the name amravati when he was at uh, uh, Suan Mok Monastery, Ajahn Buddha Dasa's monastery in southern Thailand, and uh, he'd first seen the, the replicas of the the, uh, uh, the ancient friezes and images from the Amravati Stupa, uh, uh, is in uh, originally in southern India, what's now Andhra Pradesh. Actually, it's the its own state now, um, and um, uh, the new Amravati is the capital of the new state <laughs> down in southern India. And the Lumpur had seen these these sculptures and uh, and heard the name Amravati where they were copied from and and that had stuck in his mind as a, a beautiful word a beautiful um, say way of referring to that principle of transcendence the deathless realm. So I was reflecting on, on the this uh, the these uh, these themes uh, recently and. Uh, I was remembering how the first person that I was with when they were dying was uh, right here at Amravati uh, in the the, uh, the late eighties, and uh, it was a, a woman from uh, from a Thai family, uh, a, a Muslim Thai family, and uh, she had become a very devoted student of of uh, Lumpur Sumato. She had come along with other friends in the early days of Chithurst and had become a very dedicated uh, meditator and practitioner and developed a lot of faith in Buddha Dhamma. And uh, she contracted cancer. She had uh, breast cancer, I believe, and uh, and so she she thought she was and she was under the impression and had been told she didn't have long to live, and so she asked permission from her family if she could go into into robes, and so she um, she received that permission and then took the eight precepts with with our community. Um, uh, and then so she uh, in the in the early days of Chithurst, and she she lived with us there for uh, for quite some time, and then her cancer went into remission, <laughs> so she she didn't pass away at that time, and so uh, she ended up leaving the robes again, going back to lay life for a time, but then uh, a few years later the cancer returned, and uh, once again she asked if she could, uh, and it really looked like it was going to be terminal this time. Uh, very clearly, so she asked if she could come and rejoin the community. So uh, her part, her lay name was uh, Amina, Amina Kulianond, and uh, her Pali name was Dasaniya. And so she uh, was was living in the uh, the, the nuns area, and we, um, people were hoping to take care of her uh, as uh, she was ending her days. And uh, we would, during the, those last weeks of her life, we would go and spend time just sitting in her room, meditating with her, both the nuns and the monks. And uh, her, her room became a, became a sort of alternative shrine room. And uh, we had a, a, a bit of a, a rota. I, f I forget exactly how it was organized, <laughs> but uh, we would take it in turns and go and spend time with her. And it was a very, um, obviously she she was in a dying process, so there was a lot of pain and difficulty for her. But also her, her room was always very uh, peaceful and serene, and it was it was always very delightful to, to be there and to be uh, uh, sitting with her. And uh, and so it was. Even though she was she was dying, there was also uh, along with that sadness of a life coming to an end. There was also a, a joyfulness and ease because she was not sort of resenting that or or, um, or uh, say resistant to to the dying process. But really, had, was she was a very mature practitioner and had really sort of opened her heart to the the 
the ending of her life, uh, as far as I could tell, and the conversations that I had with her, I was I wasn't a very senior monk at that time. I was just sort of part of the the, the group, and, and so more often she would be uh, talking with Lumpur Sumato, and and uh, that would be uh, so sort of where she was getting her instruction. But I, I was often along and there uh, when uh, she, either she was um, getting some advice from Lumpur or, or just sitting in her room meditating. And uh, the, the reason I, I brought it up this evening and uh, was particularly because I was there when she died, and uh, it was uh, it was quite uh, common that we we thought the last moments were coming, and then people would gather around, and then she would uh, her breath would get very very shallow, and we would think, okay, this is today's the day, and then she would rally, she would recover, and then uh, her strength would come back, and and then uh, we would sort of. Going to breathe, breathe a sigh of relief again, and she would, and she carried on, and that happened a few times over, and so uh, uh, this had been the case once more, and um, people really thought it was the end. A lot of friends of hers had come from from London and gathered around and been with her through the late afternoon and evening, and but she she'd recovered and stabilized, and so people had had gone away again. And uh, I was in the uh, in her room, and we would keep we're keeping like a twenty four hour vigil with her at this time. So it was about it was about one o'clock in the morning, and uh, I was there with um, uh, 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 Ajahn Chandapalo. Uh, he was uh, a, a, a monk here at that time, myself, and a, a couple of the Sila Tara, I think uh, the earlier. The uh, Ajahn, uh, Sister Jitapala, the first, not the German German Jitapala, the Swiss Jitapala, <laughs> was uh, was there in the room, and, um, and maybe one or two of the other nuns, I forget exactly. Uh, maybe Ajahn Chandasiri was. Anyway, suffice to say, there was uh, there was just a, a, a handful of us, maybe uh, four or five of us in the room with her. And um, Sister Jitapala was holding her, and her breath was getting lighter and lighter. And uh, but it was you know one o'clock in the morning, so things were a bit uh, uh, quiet and sleepy. And and uh, and so uh, sitting there in the, the quiet of her room in the middle of the night, sitting on the floor with uh, with the Tan Chandapalo, and just hearing the sound of her breath. And the, the mind was was very very quiet, very but also very very it was very energetic. Kind of the mind was a bit fuzzy from being in the middle of the night, but there was also a, a an energy, a, a brightness in the room. And then um, uh, it's, uh, suddenly, uh, Sister Jitapala said, "She's gone." And part of me had been expecting uh, the moment of death. I'd never been with anyone when they died before. So part of me was thinking, oh well, uh, you know, there'll be a kind of uh, a sort of wave of energy through the room, or the curtains will ruffle, or some, something will happen. And um, part, I was completely unconsciously expecting something like that. And then, uh, then, it was, but there was nothing. There was Sister Jitapala said she's gone. And so then there was this moment where I thought, oh, I was expecting something. And then, and then this uh, this. Uh, Strong intuition arose in my mind. Arose in my mind at that moment. Of course, nothing happened. <laughs> no, nothing. Nothing really happened. And it and it was very uh, impactful, uh, insightful moment uh, for me at that time because it became really clear that, um, and it was a very, very much a non-rational, non-conceptual uh, thought. That uh, that sort of took shape in my mind. It's like it was. It was like, well, the the mind that's aware of the breath going in, the breath uh, going out. It's just the same as the mind that knows a body being born and a body dying. What's the difference? A breath arises and passes away. A body arises and passes away. How could there be any difference? And it wasn't really a verbal thought. It was not like a, a kind of a a sentence with a beginning and an end, but more just a, a, a direct, uh, intuitive understanding that that was the case. It was like it was not. There was nothing really arguable about it. It was just oh, that's how it. That's how it works. And uh, 
And and it was uh, really strikingly obvious. Of course, the mind that knows the body alive is just the same as the mind that knows the body dead. And again, without it being particularly rational, there was something that that had the, the understanding that that uh, uh, Sister Dasania's mind knows that the, just as it knew the the body alive and the body breathing, there's a, a knowing of the body no longer breathing. Um, I'm not saying I was having a kind of psychic. Uh, ability to to read her mind, but there was just that sense of well, how how could it be different? Is is the mind which is an arising and passing away, and that also that quality of well, nothing happened. There, um, there was there was really no no change, and just like a breath comes in, a breath goes out, uh, a day begins, a day ends, uh, a body is born, a body dies. What's uh, what could be different about that? So that was a, a, a very insightful uh, moment for me, and then a re really sort of uh, I really took that to heart. Um, and that uh, there were, and in the, in the days following on from that, I was you know, re reflecting on that a lot, and just to see that kind of obviousness with which the that uh, took shape. Uh, the how natural and obvious it was that you know the mind that knows birth is the mind that knows death. It knows a beginning. It knows an ending. But that which is, is knowing is totally independent of the the beginnings and the endings. And so, and uh, as I was uh, looking at that and exploring that, it, it took shape in my mind as uh, as how the sun relates to the to the uh, the earth, the world, and the planets that. And just as say it's natural for us to say the sun comes up in the morning, the sun rises in the east and crosses across the sky and then sets in the west. Uh, you know that because we live on the surface of the earth, then that's what we say. That's uh, we, we're living here on the surface of the planet, so the sun rises and sets. But what that uh, the insight that arose with with uh, Dasania's uh, passing away. But uh, when uh, uh, when I re reflected on that, was was very much along the lines of, well, what does the sun know about it, the the, uh, the rising and setting of it? What, what does the sun know about its rising and setting? From the position of the sun, it's not rising and setting. The uh, from the if you take the that image uh, of the solar system with the, the sun, the great bright sun at the center, and then you have the little you know, blue blue and green dot kind of s spinning around off in the rope remoteness of space. Yeah, there's a, there's a spinning around of the, of the world, and it's turning in its ellipse, elliptical or orbit. It's going in its orbit around the sun. But what does the sun know about its, its rising and setting? Uh, and that that took took shape as a as an image of this is really what the heart of wisdom that sort of the bright sun of wisdom there at the center of of this life this this heart this mind that's what the, this is really embodying it's like the when the when the mind is awake when it's wise when there is genuine mindfulness a heedfulness then it knows the 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 world it knows the spinning of the world. The, and you can think of the world, you can spell it two different ways, W-O-R-L-D, the world, as we think of it usually, and the world, W-H-I-R-L-E-D, like that which is whirling around and spinning, the, the whirling, uh, the whirling world. Uh, the, uh, when the, the heart embodies that quality of awakened wisdom, that bright the great bright sun of of, of wisdom, the, the heart of Dhamma itself, then the the patterns of, of comings and goings, the risings and ceasings, the you know, the, the the days and nights, uh, gains and losses, and so forth, they're they're happening, they're they're known, but they're they're not d disturbing or or limiting to that uh, that quality of awakened awareness, that that knowing at the center. Of things, and when we talk about the deathless, uh, the, the quality of deathlessness, then uh, and, and I realize that all all analogies or similes like this, they are they are kind of partially they can only be partially true or partially relevant. 
but uh, I feel it, it's uh, you can say, oh yeah, but the, you know, it's not as though the sun is, yeah, but the sun is moving too. The sun is spinning around, and it's also it, uh, the whole Milky Way. The, our galaxy is spinning around. That takes twenty-two thousand years to to rotate, and then everything is expanding from the Big Bang. So yeah, you can't say that the sun is still, but. Astronomy aside, <laughs> the, just taking this as a as a symbol of our little solar system. That imagine taking the sun to be the uh, fixed at the center, and then the the planets to be revolving around that. Just in for the purposes of this particular analogy, this particular image, I feel that's a, a really good way of symbolizing the the nature of that deathless reality that um, when we talk about deathlessness and that quality of transcendence and, and say what this uh, the aim of, of this monastery uh, Amravati, this community is is the realization of that deathless reality to to uh, help the heart to awaken uh, to its own nature as that that bright sun uh, great bright sun uh, of Dhamma the very at the very center and then from that central uh, awake uh, uh, position as it were then the, the there can be the knowing of all of the different patterns of of the world the arisings and ceasings the the uh, beginnings and endings of our life the in the in breath and the out breath days coming and going feelings of of uh, pleasure and pain coming and going so uh, and when we so when we talk about the the deathless or deathlessness, then it's it, uh, as it, Lung Po Sumedho again would quote very very often, uh, uh, probably still does. <laughs> but uh, in those in those days, it was almost like the sort of national motto of Amravati was uh, that verse from the, the Dhammapada: "Mindfulness is the path to the deathless; heedlessness is the path to death. The mindful never die." The heedless are as if dead already, and so when uh, when uh, we would uh, reflect on that, or when when Lumpur would, would quote that from the from the Dhammapada, then it, it uh, it's making clear. You know, when it says that the mindful never die, it doesn't mean that the bodies never die. <laughs> it, it, it's not uh, uh, making that kind of assumption or declaration at all. Rather, it's saying that which is real. When there's genuine mindfulness, upamada, heedfulness, when the mind is fully awake and aware, then it's not identified with the, the all of the the births and deaths, the comings and goings, the gains and losses. It's not. It's uh, in a way, it's it's stopped attaching or identifying with the the, the whirling world, the spinning world, uh, and it's instead uh, embodying that the the great bright uh, vast sun of of Dhamma uh, that's at the very center of this life of ours, the center of everything, that, that very quality of nature itself. Uh, and, and that's uh, uh, the uh, I feel is a uh, is a, a good principle to be recollecting at uh, uh, you know, living here at Amravati, and also those who are you know, watching this um, uh, the recording of this Dhamma talk or, uh, outside the monastery and around the world uh, to to be reflecting that uh, on this to really take that to heart. You don't the geographical Amravati is not. Is not the deathless realm <laughs> on an absolute level. It's but it's a a place that is established to encourage human beings to realize and to embody that deathless quality. But uh, obviously, it's not confined to this geographical spot. But rather, if we take that verse from the, that teaching from the Dhammapada, it's pointing to the absolute importance of of heedfulness of that awakened awareness. Uh, Appamada amatabadang, mindfulness, heedfulness is the path to the deathless. Uh, heedlessness is the path to death. The mindful never die. The heedless are as if dead already. So that then, uh, what is it? <laughs> Where does that fear come from? You know, the, 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 the instinctual recoiling uh, from, from physical death and also the, the other kinds of 
of psychological, social, emotional deaths that we similarly uh, recoil from and are intimidated by and, and so sort of shocked and, and challenged by in our lives. But, um, and in that 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 respect, you know, you, you can hear a dhamma talk like this, or take that principle and say, "Oh yes, well, I'll I'll just be, I'll just embody that quality of awakened, uh, aware wisdom. I'll just realize uh, the the uh, that is the the true nature of the mind. I'll take refuge in that awakened awareness, and then all, all suffering will will come to an end. I'll no longer be threatened or afraid of those deaths and and uh, psychological and physical deaths and losses uh, you, you can't just take the idea and make the idea an actuality the idea sort of points the way or talk uh, say indicates how things work but it, it's uh, it's not enough just to have the idea it's not enough just to have the words sort of printed on a mug or on a t-shirt or <laughs> sort of written in beautiful calligraphy up, up on uh, up on your wall the, the words are not enough the uh, the words are, are say, indicating how the principle operates, but the words alone cannot really liberate. So uh, in this respect, I, I feel it's really helpful to see what is it that sustains that, that fear and the, uh, the, 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 the kind of um, tangles that our hearts uh, get into uh, that the, the make us so limited and burdened and, and stressed, so, so fearful in, in these lives of ours. Uh, the um, there's a, a set of uh, of when you know, the Buddha talks about this in many many ways, and uh, and in the teachings, one of the the the, the forms that I think is very helpful to reflect on is what is called the eight worldly dhammas, the lok, uh, lokya dhamma, the eight uh, sometimes known as the eight worldly winds. Uh, uh, and these are in uh, are ordered into four pairs. So these are, and I would say this is a good summary of, of where we get caught up and what the, the causes of these sort of these fears and stresses, these tensions of the heart. So these are the, probably very well known to most people who are here, who have seen and read about, heard about it over, the, over time. But I feel it's it's good to to reflect on this. This is what, say, makes the uh, attention, uh, say, uh, be distracted from that quality of awakened awareness, that clear, mindful, awake, aware quality. When the when the heart, the mind, really knows knows the world and is uh, is unentangled in the world, unattached to it. Uh, what causes those habits of attachment and, and uh, is then the the cause of that fearfulness and, and stressfulness. The uh, these uh, these eight lokya dhammas. You have the first two uh, are gain and loss. That's the first pair. The second are fame and disrepute. The third pair is praise and criticism. And the the last pair uh, is uh, pleasure and pain. Uh, and uh, the, the Buddha said, he, uh, the Buddha puts it uh, as he as he starts to talk about this. He says, uh, these eight qualities they revolve around the world, and the world revolves around them. That's a, an interesting way to to reflect on it. So this is how, how much of our lives and our our, uh, our patterns of thinking, our emotional reactions are around exactly these uh, these qualities: uh, gain and loss, uh, fame and disrepute, uh, praise and criticism, and uh, pleasure and pain. So if we take a take a snapshot of, uh, of our lives, our days, just to see how much time and, uh, and energy is spent getting concerned with uh, with these qualities, probably for for most of us here uh, living at Amravati, then fame is not a, a very attractive. <laughs> most of us are not particularly interested in being famous. Uh, but we do like to be, uh, I would say most of us do like to be uh, free of pain. We do like to uh, to be praised rather than criticized. Uh, and uh, 
uh, uh, most of us like to to gain rather than than lose in, in various different ways. I'm, I'm, I don't want to make assumptions about where people are at, but uh, I feel that these are are uh, very helpful to look at and to see how, in the course of a day, how often we are finding ourselves. I say when we get when we gain something or we get something. Oh yes, I, I got that. It's what a you know a, a, a lovely place to a nice room to live in or a, a, a beautiful uh, a, a beautifully cooked food or, or um, we are, uh, have a really a, a really good friendship. And then when we experience loss, when uh, when that really delicious-looking food, the last portion of it was taken by somebody else before we got to the, the place on the server, or that uh, that that good friend, that person who was a really good friend of yours last year, now that that friendship is lost. Something's gone sour between you, and that there's a sense of uh, of loss. Oh, I, I had such a good friendship; we had a good relationship, and now it's gone. Uh, uh, the the many and various different ways in our lives that we experience these these dualities and uh, how we the positive ones or what you can think of as positive so that the gain fame praise and pleasure <laughs> to to list the the ones that are supposedly attractive how when we experience those the mind goes yes good and we we take ownership of that. There's a sense of inclining towards and and taking hold, and then the the ones that are are more associated with with uh, difficult difficulty and off-putting qualities. So loss, uh, <clears throat> disrepute, having a bad reputation, uh, being criticised, and pain. You know, just even saying the words, you know, loss, disrepute. Uh, criticism and and pain just even saying the words and i'm i'm giving the talk it just there's a sort of off putting quality just to the to the words themselves so there's a recoiling so uh just to to look at our, our lives to to scan the the memory of a day or to look at uh, the the course of a, our experience during an average day how much time and effort and energy do we spend uh, trying to take hold of the uh, the pleasant and the attractive ones and trying trying to get away from the the painful and off-putting difficult these are uh, i'm not reading anybody's mind i'm not sort of keeping track of what people do or how you spend your time uh, but rather uh it, it just in in living in community watching my own mind and, and uh, having conversations with people you know, it, uh, over and over and over again it's so it's uh, so clear how much uh I say these dualities dominate uh, our lives and how we keep uh when there's a lack of mindfulness, a lack of uh, of upamada, there's pamada. <laughs> when there's heedlessness, as the Buddha said, heedlessness is the path to death. We keep creating the causes for death, for psychological death. We keep uh, looking for security in that which is that can't, can't provide. So it can't be stable, it can't provide security. We keep looking for happiness in things that that can't really provide that. We keep looking for for um say uh, a sense of uh, value and solidity in things that, that can't provide it so we keep getting disappointed we get born into our our friendships our possessions our living places our physical body our, our feelings of comfort we get born into to our positive mind states that come from meditation. Oh, yes, I've really got it now. Yeah, for, oh, that was a really good meditation. That was great. Uh, yes, <laughs> yeah. All uh, not to be too sort of sour or negative, but rather it's uh, it's to recognise how strong those habits are. When the mind goes, yes, this is great. This is fantastic. This is just what I wanted. You know, the the encouragement is to notice that. <laughs> And exactly the same way, when we say, "Oh no, that's exactly what I didn't want. This is really that's so painful. That was that was so good. Now it's over. It used to be so so nice, and now uh, we we've lost that. We can't do the chanting. Uh, yeah, it's a real loss. Or we can't have people coming to visit, and and uh, people who are, are so devoted, so dedicated to the monastery, and they they can't they they can't come in. It's a, it's painful to to have the doors closed to not allow people to be using the the property. 
property. Oh, we can't use the retreat center. We can't haven't run any meditation retreats on site. We've done we've uh, done a certain amount of online teaching during this year, but haven't been able to have any on site retreats at the retreat center. Ah, it's it's painful. All the more uh, uh, worldly and selfish losses. You know that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I really wanted that room, but I didn't get. I got this lousy room instead. <laughs> I could have had that one. All right, I had that really good place last year, and now uh, I'm stuck with this. So, whether it, uh, uh, wherever it's coming from, to look at those. This is uh, this is a, a a bad, wrong, uh, painful thing. That uh, that kind of psychological death or the ego death, as I like to call it, that comes with being criticized, being blamed, losing uh, something that you thought that you had, uh, physical pain, just the, the, the aches and pains of the body as we, as we all get older and as the body is uh, stressed and strained through the ordinary flow of circumstance, just to, uh, no, you know, just to notice, oh, not my left knee as well. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, not my back. Oh, what's happening to my eyes? I can't. Why is everything so blurry? Ah, oh, not another pair of glasses. Oh no. Just to be seeing that right there, the mind has taken refuge in comfort, or has taken refuge in being able to see clearly, or has been taken refuge in having a particular room, or, or, uh, or like today it was the first uh, first day in a while where we could actually see the blue sky, and and uh, it was very foggy, misty, and uh, all day for the last uh, few days before this, and then oh hooray, the sun's out, the sky is blue, great. And not to again, not to be too sour or kind of curmudgeonly. For those of you who know, that sort of grumpy, <laughs> a curmudgeon is a sort of grumpy old man. Uh, the uh, cur curmudgeonly attitude, right? but to see the mind that goes, yes, this is good. Then to notice, oh, here is the mind taking hold of what it, uh, of a particular pattern of experience and calling it good, and. Uh, that's that's a a flavour. There's a texture to that yesness, and it's like this. And similarly, when the the mind goes, oh no, not another, uh, not another injury, not another uh, uh, tweak in the body, or not another one of those. To notice, oh, here is the mind uh, recoiling from uh, the 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 painful the bitter the difficult this is when you've been criticized for something that you've done or criticized for the way you you talk or the way you walk or what you've you know, something you've you've said that's upset somebody to to feel okay this is what criticism feels like it's like this when when there's a, a loss when the, when uh, you are uh, say you f you find out that you've got a, a bad reputation, people don't don't respect you, or don't don't think that you're a very good monk or a very good nun or a very good person, or you don't do your job very well. The, you know, the last person who did that, they they were actually much better at it. So even though we say oh, I'm not interested in fame, <laughs> you know, but even with with much more local things, fame is not just about having your your face on a poster or, or being known around the world, but that just uh, being uh, uh, someone who's got a, a good reputation for a uh, for, for doing a job well, that they can we can relish in that. Someone says, "Oh, you're so good at this. This is fantastic. I'm really glad that you're you're the 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 work monk or the the work nun or the you know you really look after the stores so well." Oh, <laughs> right there. That's that's what we mean by birth. Your the mind is born into that praise, born into that 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 gain, born into that that happy feeling. And if we're born into the 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 pleasant side of it, then we're still attached to it when it turns into the 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 painful side. So this is where I would say in that analogy of the sun and the and the the world, where the 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 mind has left that central position and got born into the world it is tied to the 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 risings and and fallings the 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 beginnings and endings the births and deaths and so that uh, that 
that uh, that centrality, that uh, that quality of of stability and centrality is is lost because of of that birth. The mind is born into different states. It's a bhava. It's born into into gain so it's it's still holding that <laughs> when it turns into a loss it's born into praise so it's still holding it when it turns into criticism it, it's born into fame and it's still holding it when it's turn turns into disrepute and it's born into to pleasure and it's uh, still holding it when it turns into into disrepute uh, some sometimes we think well i'll just uh, I, I, I'm sure there's a way you can attach to pleasure and success and gain and praise and then let go before it turns into its opposite. <laughs> but I'd say you've got to be really quick on your feet to to uh, to, to to pull that off. And you know, the, if we're going to follow the advice of, of our teachers, uh, the, the Buddha's teaching and and the various elders who have uh, taught over the the centuries, then the the wisdom of the ages tells us yeah you, this, you, you, you you're not going to be able to do that that's not the way that it works far better it is to 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 recognize how that whole system works and to learn not not uh, to be born to to be refraining from that that uh, that whole process of of uh, say uh, attaching to to praise and gain and uh, and and pleasure and uh, <clears throat> and also it's not that uh, we're just trying to flatten uh, and make all our uh, make all of our experience a, a kind of uh, um, uniform bland uh, sort of even uh, evenness it's not as though we're trying to sort of neutralize our emotions or neutralize and flatten our feelings not at all but rather it's just training the heart not to be uh as say uh, taking refuge and being born into those uh those states either the pleasant or the painful and that uh, it's a so it's not a condemnation of pleasure and success and and uh, and uh, again and so forth but recognizing if you're if you're uh, looking for those sweet experiences to be something that can ultimately satisfy or liberate then you're, you're looking in the wrong place uh, and uh, this is a kind of um, expression that Lumpur Cha would use very very often so if you're looking at, if you're looking for finality in that which is endless you're going to be disappointed if you're looking for security in that which is unstable you have to be disappointed if you're if you're looking for for happiness in something that cannot satisfy it necessarily you are going to be disappointed there's there's, there's no way around that it's like uh that that the old story of uh the um the person who was uh uh, uh, on a uh, on a, a street uh, under a street lamp, where there's a, a little pool of light under a street lamp, and uh, on their hands and knees, uh, uh, looking around for something on the ground, and somebody comes up to him and says, um, "Yeah, uh, what are you doing?" And they said, "Oh, I, I dropped my car keys." And they said, "Oh, that's uh, 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 okay. can I help you?" And they said, well, "Where where do you think you dropped them?" He said, "Well, I dropped them over by my car, but but uh, uh, this is where the light is, so I, this is where I'm looking for them." Because this is the only, this is where I can see. I said, "Well, that's really stupid. You're looking in a place where you're not going to find the keys, so you have to be disappointed." And you know, the uh, uh, you can translate that into your into your own life in so many so many different ways. But uh, we do that, even though we think, "Well, that's ridiculous. If you if you dropped your car keys fifty yards away, you're not going to look." Uh, in a different spot altogether you think well that's that's a really stupid analogy you know who would do that <laughs> but if we look at our lives if we look at the way that we operate it's uh, amazing how often we're we're under the street lamp looking for our keys where we didn't drop them we're, we're looking for for happiness and things that that can't satisfy we're looking for security uh, in things that are unstable uh, we, we we keep doing that <laughs> Even though it's, when you look at it, uh, it's ridiculous, but uh, we we keep doing that. So the, the the Buddha's advice is to to reflect, and 
when we are experiencing gain, when things go well, when we have, when we're praised, when uh, when we have a, a good reputation, when people uh, re say admire us or, or value our skill with uh, particular jobs around the monastery or in or our role in the family or in the, in in the world in a different aspect, different living situation, different aspects of of our lives. Uh, when we are feeling pleasure, like, this is really good. Just like this afternoon, uh, it's a bright sunshine, and in the winter, this is one of the things about being in England in early December, <laughs> the winter time, because the sun is so low, then it reflects off the the ripples on the pond in in my garden uh, much uh, for for a long time during the afternoon because the sun is low in the sky, so the the light bounces off the water, and so uh, there's this beautiful patterns of of light and shade rippling across the the walls and the ceiling of my kuti for a long time through the afternoon. So I can sit there and I watch this beautiful you know movement of light and shadow. And the interesting, uh, the, um, the silhouettes of the cactus that's bounced on the ceiling and shimmering up and down the walls, and quite a light show, <laughs> a free light show in my kuti in the, in the afternoon. Oh, this is so beautiful, this is so lovely. So it's delightful, it's beautiful. But if, uh, if there's a, 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 an investment in that, oh, this is great, I want to have this all the time. <laughs> if, yeah, if, uh, if the mind goes in that direction, then necessarily you're going to be disappointed. But if at that moment you go, well, this is delightful, this is beautiful, full stop. Then you, if you recognize, well, this is just a, the delight of, a, of the, the movement of patterns of water and, and shadow and light that comes with, a, with an English winter, it's like this. And if the mind reflects in that way, it's not something that can be permanently satisfying. It's, uh, it's not something that is is stable or predictable it might never be experienced again i might i might drop dead today you know just uh, just uh, have an aneurysm or just uh, swallow a a a mouthful of of uh, of tea or coffee and it goes down the wrong way suddenly it's all over you know and then uh, not that I'm expecting that, but who is? You know? <laughs> Maybe that's the, the last time that'll ever be experienced. But if the mind attaches to it and says, "Oh, I want to have this," uh, all this, how can I engineer things so I'm always here every December, early in, in December every year? How can I fix it so that I always get this all the time? And so then the mind is is hanging on to it. It's not actually there with the play of light on the eye and being perceived. It's sort of planning for how I can keep this and <laughs> make it happen next year and the year after. And so then the the the, the beauty of it is lost by the mind's grasping of it. And so. Uh, the encouragement with those eight worldly dhammas, uh, the Buddha says, if they, if the mind is not obsessed with those or take, not um, taking refuge in gain and loss, fame and disrepute, fame and disrepute, praise and criticism, pleasure and pain, but it knows them as they are, knows them as changing patterns of experience. That these are these are anicca; they're in a state of transformation. They're not permanent, and they are their dukkha. They can't fully satisfy. Then they they are understood as they are, and so then the the heart does not get born in the, into them. Now, when we talk about not being born, if the mind is is uh, conditioned to be uh, attached to uh, sort of thinking in, in worldly terms, it can sound quite nihilistic, like uh, the sort of anti-life and, and a sort of a negation or a curmudgeonly attitude, like bar humbug. You know, uh, it's it's all it's all dukkha, and just sort of switch off and ignore it all. But that that is a nihilistic attitude, and it's not what uh, is the essence of, of not being born. So I would say not being born is about uh, the heart uh, realizing its own nature as Dhamma. It's like being the the, the great bright sun at, at the center of, of everything, embodying the Dhamma, being Dhamma. Um, and rea you know, realizing that that has always been the case. And it was only because of the, the uh, habitual... Uh, say distraction with uh, and the word distraction literally means being pulled apart from the from the, the the latin roots of it 
the mind is sort of the, the attention is pulled apart from that uh, that central quality of of dhamma it's pulled into birth in liking and disliking gaining and losing pra- being praised and being criticized uh, comfort and discomfort uh, and and when when it's not born then that's not a, a negation or a, a, a sort of a, a, a uh, an annihilation it's not a, a nihilistic attitude rather it's uh, an embodiment of nature itself it's it's uh, really a way of talking about being dhamma itself the um the the mind is able to 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 know those habits of grasping those habits of identification and uh that uh when those habits of grasping are recognized in the different areas where the mind grasps then uh, and we see you know so maybe you don't have a a difficulty getting uh, sort of reactive around pleasure and pain but it's really difficult to deal with praise and criticism particularly being criticized or for some people being praised is more difficult to deal with than being criticized for uh, for some people it's like oh you're so wonderful this is so great i'm so happy you're around like oh, don't say that <laughs> that some some of us are like that that uh, uh, it's much easier to fail than to succeed oh dear i've done it I, i've succeeded again oh it's much more comfortable if i just make a mess of it all the time then nobody expects anything of me <sighs> it's more it's uh, then if you if you do things well then people just keep like, keep wanting you to do it again <sighs> And so it's better. To, it's easier to be a failure. So, but wherever we we see the habits of mind and the, the habits of attachment, and grasping, get to know that, get familiar with that. And then wherever those those habits of grasping take shape, then that's the place to to let go. And and when we speak about ending birth or not being born again. Even though the languaging of that can seem a bit sort of anti anti life or nihilistic, if uh, if we reflect this, the the last verse uh, of the uh, the Buddha's teaching on loving kindness, uh, it's speaking exactly about this. This uh, the the habits of uh, I would say is the, the the different kinds of grasping that the mind gets caught into. The, the Buddha goes through them, at least in so one way of reading that final verse of the, the Buddha's words on loving kindness. The Buddha's going through each of the, the four different kinds of grasping and saying how when those are all let go of, when those, those habits of grasping are, are abandoned, then one, uh, then one is not born again into this world. It's the, the, uh, the, the heart is freed from that distractive process, so that uh, the um, the different kinds of grasping. Uh, again, we are sort of speaking about the uh, uh, the kind of areas where we get caught up um, by not holding to fixed views. Is talking about ditu padana, like the way the mind grasps an opinion, views and opinions. The pure-hearted one, you can think, you can look at that as re- reflate, uh, relating to what's called silabat upadana, or the the mind grasping conventions and forms, rituals, and and um, and uh, the uh, say the, the standards that we 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 used to, the, the the patterns of doing things, the conventions, social conventions that we live with. Um, Having clarity of vision, that you can think of that as relating to uh, atavadu padana, clinging to the uh, the feelings of I and me and mine. Um, being freed from all sense desire is uh, re- relates to kamu padana, the attachment to sense pleasure and clinging to sense pleasure. Uh, being freed from all sense desire, one is not born again into this world, so that. The uh, the encouragement of the teaching then is to to recognise where each one of us <laughs> our own particular habits of of, uh, of attachment where where we go yes and no to get to to know those areas really directly to to feel them to know them where do we get born <laughs> where does where does the, the heart uh, 
have its its familiar tracks of distraction. What are those those channels of distraction, those pathways that the mind so easily runs down and gets born? Get to know them, get get familiar with those to see. Yeah, you know, do you? Uh, you know, maybe you're not too bothered by the pursuit of sense pleasure, but you really like your opinions, and your your opinions are not really opinions; they're actually facts. You know, it's not an opinion. It's, it's not an opinion. It's a truth. I, I know I'm right. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> look at that. Look at that. That feeling of of rightness uh, and uh, the that sense. It's not an opinion. It's a fact. Ajahn, <laughs> to look at that. Feel that. Or uh, whether the mind is uh, attached to uh, the conventions that we have, the right way to to do things, the wrong way to do things, how people should be, how they should act, how they shouldn't act, our traditions, our customs of Theravada Buddhism, and or the way things are done in in England and and my family or my in my way, I like to do things. The uh, uh, the story, our life story, the Atavad Upadana, my, who I am. I'm a woman, I'm a man, I'm old, I'm young, I'm tall, I'm short. You know, I'm an artist, I'm a banker, I'm a, 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 a creative type, I'm a sensitive type, I'm a methodical type, you know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a successful type, I'm a failure. <laughs> All of those I ams, the, the, the way we create a story and make it so solid and real. I would say this is all to do with the, the Atavada uh, Upadana. Again, there's, there's, these are not fixed or, or, or definitive ways of relating to these qualities, but just um, my uh, suggestion of, of how we can look at it. But I'd say Atavada Upadana, it's not just the feeling of I am, but that taking the narrative, our own story, to be so real, so important. Yeah, my life, my saga. <laughs> So not grasping the, the Atavada is just not being interested in your, your own story so much, just looking at your life story just like anybody else's life story. I think I was talking the other day about looking at gravestones, you know, the names on gravestones kind of worn away by the weather and how you, know, you can hardly even make out the, um, uh, some of the letters. Can't really need to read the name clearly. Like, why is your life so much more real and solid than the life that that gravestone is indicating? And, you know, I love to reflect in that way. Like, my, but my life is so important, and you know, <laughs> me and my story and what I am. And then you know, there's a, a name on a grave. And so, why was why is this life more real or more important than the one marked by that piece of rock just to put in the ground? How could how could it be more important? <sighs> then the um, uh, the areas where we 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 grasp that's where we let go, and then that in that moment of letting go, even if uh, it's it's only known for a moment, pay attention to that in the meditation or during the course of a day when you recognize oh it's just liking or it's just the sweetness of being praised or it's just the painfulness of being criticized again it's just bitter it's just a bitter taste that's all ah <sighs> notice the quality of the heart when that that moment of realization of that's all it's just this ha <sighs> you feel that to really know that. I would say that's the experience of the deathless right there. It, even if it's just so brief, so momentarily, so momentary that it, it is easily missed and the mind jumps on to the next thing that I've got to do or the next uh, impactful uh, thing to deal with. Pay attention to that, those moments when the mind is not grasping. That The cessation of grasping is deathlessness. Bhavani rodho nibbanang, the cessation of grasping, of becoming, is nibbana, is, is uh, the experience of, of deathlessness. In that moment of non grasping, even though it seems like nothing special, that ah, at that moment I'd say the heart is embodying that, that great bright sun of, of Dhamma. It's, it's, it's uh, embodying. Actualizing its own nature, that the the heart is being dhamma at that moment, 
and it's nothing remarkable, but it is a, a feeling of of uh, simplicity, completeness, relief, ease. It's completely natural, completely ordinary, and uh, and delightful. So notice those moments of uh, of peacefulness, of clarity, simplicity, a, a total normality. <laughs> Just to, uh, I'm not saying that's a full enlightenment uh, experience, but rather I would say in that moment, notice what that's like when the heart is free of grasping, and then to reflect on those particular teachings. The cessation of grasping is deathlessness. So maybe when we use a word like deathless, it can seem a bit dramatic and something remote and far out and, and sort of uh, strange. But I would suggest that that uh, quality of the simplicity of the heart, that, that quality of natural ease that is present when the grasping stops, then right there, that the, has the flavor of the deathless. That's the, the presence of the, of the deathless is, is, is here when the grasping stops, when the, 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 the mind is not born into things, then when that birth isn't there, then it's embodying its own its own quality as the Dhamma itself is. It's uh, being Dhamma itself. So I offer these thoughts for consideration today. <laughs>